The next one I, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, today is Paul Wiley and Craig uh, Stevenson. Paul's Chief Executive on the Buller District Council since 2011. Paul has worked in a wide range of roles throughout his career, including managerial roles in the health sector, Chief Executive of the South Island Dairy Farmers Limited, and Chief Executive of Palmerston North City Council and Tasman. Craig is the Chief Executive of the uh, South Taranaki District Council and has been Chief Executive for the past uh, 10 years. And they're both going to give a slightly different view, one coming from the West Coast, uh, sort of around the minerals, and Craig then talking uh, around about petroleum and uh, oil and petroleum, and their perspective as they see it around the uh, royalties issues. So welcome, I think, uh, Paul, you're first up. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Um, I haven't got any PowerPoints. I just want to tell you our story. It's a bit personal and a bit focused on the bullet, but it really covers the whole coast. And people need to understand that the West Coast gets referred to as just one little place. It's actually a strip of land that's the same distance as it is from Auckland to Wellington, but there's only 33,000 people. Now, population experts tell us that half of New Zealand's councils are losing population. And even of the rest, at least a quarter of them are just standing still. There's only about 11 councils in New Zealand that are gaining population, and most of them are metropolitan. What that means in population terms is that the regions are doing it tough. It's very hard to maintain modern standards and to try and give people what they expect today when you've got less and less ratepayers to pay the bills. That wasn't the problem when I first arrived in Westport in November 2011. The Buller District economy was booming. The streets were lined with big flash four-wheel drives, Pradas everywhere, great big numbers on their sides, and big orange lights on top. Every motel had a no vacancy sign. And when I went to the land agents to get somewhere to rent, there was only two addresses in the window and I was told that they'd be gone within two hours, and they were. So from the council's perspective, the biggest risk that we had at that time was speed wobbles. We wondered actually how we were gonna cope when the planned Bathurst mine came into operation and we were talking about another 400 jobs, either directly or indirectly. So when we put all that together and put our council long-term plan together and published it in May 2012, we were predicting a population gain on the back of sustained mining activity, supplemented by increased dairying, tourism, some fishing, and a bit of engineering that was starting to develop. Things were actually looking pretty good. And then just a few months later, solid energy hit the wall. If you think of those graphs that Kelvin put up before showing the difference in commodity prices, that's what it's like. And it wasn't helped because at the same time, Forest and Bird were quite successfully bleeding Bathurst dry. And so those new jobs weren't going to open up anywhere. In fact, you'd be a pretty brave person at all to think of investing over in our neck of the woods at that time. And what had been the boom very rapidly started to become the bust. And if you were a long-term coast resident, it was the bust again, because it's happened before. The redundancies and the layoffs started, cycle after cycle. Quickly, there were hundreds of empty rentals. The real estate agents don't take them anymore now because they can't rent them. Local property prices have collapsed. You sell for a huge discount, even on your rateable value at the moment. You can get a motel room any day of the week, and there's not many Pradas parked in the main street anymore. But all through that, Forest and Bird have continued their legal appeals with the avowed intention of keeping the coal in the ground. And when your economy is based on that coal, that's pretty difficult. 
Estimates vary as to the number of jobs that have evaporated over the last 18 months. But there were probably about 1,200 people dependent on the Stockton Plateau when things were at their peak. And that's now under 700. And we mightn't have hit the bottom yet. Now when you've got a town like Westport that's only got a population of just over 6,000 and you lose 500 jobs in the immediate vicinity, things take a hit. We've still got Bathurst in the wing, they've survived, but it's been at great cost. And any entry they make into the sector now will be slow and it's going to be entirely dependent on improved coal prices. So our outlook's not looking too good. Back in 2007, Statistics New Zealand dismally estimated that Buller's population would fall from just on 10,000 people to less than 9,000. They were actually predicting 8,900. But they didn't get it right. And we had that subsequent mining boom that reversed that predicted trend. And while nobody in Auckland or Wellington noticed, for two years in a row, the fastest growing economic area in New Zealand was actually Buller. And that was why, as a result of that high population, we'd thought we were heading towards a population of 11,500. But now, with the downturn biting, and the 30th of June census telling us we've only got 10,470, things are looking pretty grim. And we've obviously dropped a lot since that, that date. So realistically, as a council, we now have to think about what we can do to make sure that that horrible 2007 statistics prediction of a fall to under 9,000 doesn't finally become true. The jobs have gone and unfortunately there's more to follow. Our other major employer, a wholesome cement company, leaves us in two years. They're going to import cement now and so we lose another 80 direct jobs plus a lot of indirect activity. Unless there's a miracle recovery in coal prices, Wholesome's departure also means that our port ceases to become a viable entity. And that'll be another set of jobs that'll go and another source of income that the council had that will turn into a loss. So as a community, we're taking a battering. And you have to understand what these ebbs and flows do to communities. One moment you're high and dry, things are looking really good. And the next the tide's eating away your foundations and eating away your future. Buller, and I think the whole of the West Coast is sick of that. We want and we think we deserve a better future. But we don't want handouts, we want a hand up. And we think the whole country stands to benefit. An awful lot's made of the growth of GDP in places like Auckland and what I think are rather ill-informed spokespersons speak of the need for Auckland to succeed for the sake of all of us. We'll all suffer if Auckland doesn't succeed. Well, I'm sorry, I think that contention's wrong. Firstly, GDP is just an economic noise meter. The hard reality is that New Zealand's a trading country and it only survives and it only prospers in this world because of what we export. So what we've got to develop as a country is exports, not lattes and not celebrities. Auckland might have more than one third of the population, but it actually only produces 7% of our exports. And by way of comparison, the whole of the coast only has 33,000 people but we produce more than 3% of the exports that pay our country's way in the world. So we think that keeping the West Coast healthy and working makes good sense for all of New Zealand. When things started looking pretty crook, I went across to Western Australia and went to Perth and I met with the state officials there and asked them to explain the royalties for the region's scheme. They were marvellous and produced a whole army of people to take me through it and sent me off to look at places like Boddington that Kelvin mentioned 
Boddington is just a wee place, 1,200 people, about the size of our Reefton. And you can see the mine, it's sort of glinting glass, which I, they told me was the camp, way up on the hills in the distance. Boddington itself was just empty. And the chief executive and the mayor that I met were pretty dispirited because it wasn't doing a lot for the town. It was doing nothing for the town. They were praying that royalties to the regions would rescue them. I went to another place not far from there called Collie because it's very similar to Westport, about the same size population and it's got a slightly more diverse economy. Um, quite a contrast, um, very energetic, capable young chief executive and obviously a very united council. And they'd got all their approvals already for royalties to the region and they were going 100 miles an hour. And you could see the difference in the whole town. It was really working. And there was going to be something left when the mines finished. And that's what we're looking for. We actually want people to look at our proposals as a form of co-investment for the future. Royalties for the regions, as we've already taken for the government, only asks for a proportion of the mining royalties that are earned in our region to be retained. We don't ask for it as of right, we accept that it needs to be a contestable fund, we'll even let the government control it, and we promise to make a co-investment so that it goes back into long-term regional infrastructure. Now we've already been criticised by Mr Joyce for saying that it wouldn't be a big amount. It wouldn't. It's a tiny amount. On one hand, that means the government wouldn't miss it. Uh, and in comparison to other things, by, particularly by metropolitan standards, it'd probably only buy a metre of motorway or the front wheels on a commuter train. But to us, that small amount accruing annually will make all the difference for our small communities. Mining is currently a mainstay, but we know it's got a limited future. It's a finite resource, as Kelvin said. The estimates that I've been given are that um, it might only be 20 years before the easily accessible, high quality coal's exhausted. Other people say in Buller there might be up to 60 years. We don't know, but we know sooner or later it's going to finish. And we know we've got to diversify to have some alternative. We know that won't be easy, and it will take time, and, it will, and, and that it will need support. We've got a lot of natural advantages. West Coast's actually a great place, but they count for nothing if we can't offer people quality infrastructure, good schools, reasonable access to health services, etc. We have to have modern towns services that potential settlers and investors will see as attractive places in which to become established. Now the West Coast Councils have got together, we're ready to step up to that challenge, but we can't do it on our own. We've had some suggestions. The Greens produced a wonderful analysis of the boom-bust cycle on the West Coast, a book entitled Jobs After Coal. But the final chapter of that book on the jobs that could replace mining might as well have been blank pages. I'm sorry, but the West Coast's future salvation isn't in the form of some quaint, rusty tourism that goes into glossy pictures for, to sit on metropolitan coffee tables. And while we're on about unrealistic and patronising attitudes, did anybody stop to think just how demeaning it was when we had to beg to be allowed to pick up the wind-blown timber after Cyclone Ida? The West Coast used to being exploited, and we've learnt that exploitation comes in many forms, including political exploitation. But we want to get out of that territory, we want to have our own future. If young people are to take out a mortgage and invest in a home, on the west coast, they need to feel that there's some economic certainty and security. 
They want a secure future for themselves and for their children. We believe that the Royal Diesel Region approach is a proven model. You can take the components of it straight out of the Western Australian model and just use them as a template, a checklist for the business case you have to build to succeed under their contestable approach. It's worked extremely well in Western Australia and it would fit in as another important and critical part of some comprehensive regional development model for New Zealand. We can't all shift to Auckland. And anyway, I still think there's something fundamentally flawed with the idea that you can squash 40% of New Zealand's people into the narrowest part of the country and not have endless traffic congestion and unaffordable housing. So it makes sense to build on what's available and affordable in the regions. We appreciate what's happening already. We got great news the other day about an extension to the regional broadband. Just to put that in perspective, people here take for granted fibre optic capacity, 100 bits per second. Um, we've got tiny patches of that on the coast, but throughout Buller, most people, if they can get five per second, think they're doing rather well. Pretty hard to run a business when you're struggling like that. Our schools are good. We can seem to produce an endless supply of great young people. But every time we go into the bust one of these cycles, all those young people just get hollowed out of our communities. Economic diversification is the only long-term answer. And if that can be done on the back of existing mining without imposing additional burdens, everybody stands to win. We accept that one day coal mining will come to an end. We argue that we need to start on the solutions now if, to be, if there's to be anything left when we come to that point. But nothing comes free, and we think it's time for central government to commit to a serious discussion about the possibilities of royalties for the region scheme in New Zealand. And the West Coast previously offered itself as a pilot region to test just such a scheme, and that often remains open. We think it's a good deal, and we think it's a fair deal, and we'd just like people to give us a fair go. Thank you. Kia tato. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks to Local Government New Zealand for the invitation to come along and, and talk to you this afternoon. As you can see from the slide, my name's Craig Stevenson. I'm very proud to be the Chief Executive of the South Taranaki District Council. That's South Taranaki, not Tasman. When um, Mayor John mentioned Tasman earlier on in his, in his opening intro, I thought, you know, I could probably be from Tasman. Tasman's a pretty cool place. I could go there, <laughs> with due deference to my colleague Lindsay down the back there. Then I consulted the Oracle. I googled the ITM Cup standings, and, and I found that Canterbury was first, Taranaki second, and Tasman's third. So in the meantime, I'll stay in Taranaki. Thank you. But anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Our council has been very keen on this discussion for, for many years now. We don't have a formal policy position on it, but we certainly uh, are keen to enter into the discussion. We recognise that shared royalties or whatever it is we're going to call it, some form of revenue sharing, is a subset of a, a wider regional economic development strategy that needs to be developed both by local government, New Zealand and, and hopefully the incoming government. And we were pleased to hear recently, I think it was the 11th of August, President Lawrence Yule, LGN President, said something along the lines that a, at a address he was giving that we need to develop a joint national strategy to strengthen the future of provincial New Zealand to ensure growth across the whole country. We support that. So, let me just move on here. Today I'm going to tell our story in two parts. The oil, the oil and gas uh, story is, is Taranaki's story. Um, but I don't have a mandate to speak on behalf of the other uh, councils who are not here today, and I acknowledge Mayor Neil Volsk from uh, Stratford. I think he's the only one who is here. So I'm not talking for Stratford, New Plymouth, or even the Taranaki Regional Council. I'm here to promote the, the South Taranaki view, but as part of that, by necessity, I need to tell the wider story and put it in context of, of, of Taranaki picture. So we'll start with that. And of course, here we are, um, centre of our own little universe here in the, in, in, there in the Naki, uh, equidistant between the economic powerhouses of Auckland and, and the political powerhouses in Wellington, and that's probably not a, a bad place to be, actually. And many of you may not know that Taranaki is the only place in the world, as far as I'm aware, where you can ski and surf in the same day. You can go skiing in the morning and you can go surfing on some of our stunning breaks in the afternoon. Now, it's got nothing to do with regional economic development, but I thought, since I've got a captive audience, I'd throw in a tourism promo as well. 
Now, if you went out into the street, even right here in, in the capital, and you asked 10 people what sustains Taranaki's economy, they would probably, most of them would be able to identify the, the two key drivers, and they are these, oil and gas and dairy, as they're often referred to, uh, black gold and white gold. So that is, is a very strong position for us to be in, but I just want to look a little bit now at our, at our regional statistics because they make pretty interesting reading. In Taranaki, we have a growing population, I think it picked up four or 5,000 in the last census, um, 110,000 now, and that represents 2.4% of, of the, uh, the national 4.5 million. We have uh, about 2.8% of the businesses, there's about 508,000 economic units in, in New Zealand, we've got about 14 and a half of those in, in Taranaki. And we have a regional economy, a regional GDP, the noise meter that my colleague referred to earlier, of 8.2 billion. Now look at that percentage, it jumps to almost 4%. I'm going to come back to that imbalance a little bit later. Between 2007 and 2013, um, the national, uh, New Zealand's GDP grew by 24.5%. It was that kind of performance through the GFC that led one of the OECD commentators to describe it as one of the world's rock star economies, as I recall. Taranaki's performance during the same period, plus 47.5%, so a very strong contribution there. So, $8.2 billion sounds like a lot of money, but if we put it in context, there are 15 regional economies, it's actually middle of the pack. There are seven economies that are larger than us, as listed there, starting with, of course, Auckland, at $75 billion, and, and there are seven that, that are smaller. But when we break it down by population, that's when it starts to get interesting. So there you can clearly see on the left-hand side that Taranaki's per capita GDP is $74,000. These are 2013 figures. Um, the New Zealand average down here is 47 and a half. In the middle we've got Southland at 52, Wellington at 58, making up the staircase. This is the reason why Taranaki people get a wee bit antsy when it comes to the simplistic population-based funding allocations that come out of the centre. We believe that model needs rebalancing. When you look at our contribution to GDP versus uh, our, our per capita. So um, oil and gas in Taranaki, it's a, it's a pretty busy picture really. There are something like uh, 20 oil fields in production at the moment. Um, and there's an active drilling program stretching into the future. Now obviously the companies play this kind of stuff fairly close to their chest for their own commercial reasons, so, but we are aware there's some, some fairly exciting things happening in the not too distant future. What there are, of course, as a result of that industry, there's a whole lot of value added downstream things in terms of uh, support industries, light engineering, processing, production, and it does have, there is no doubt, significant benefits for our region. It's a happy place to be, and there are far more ups than downs. We have 5,500 jobs in Taranaki that either, according to Venture Taranaki Trust, that either directly or indirectly result from the oil and gas industry. So that's the, uh, including all that downstream support I was talking about. That's out of about 51,000 FTEs in total, so it's something like 9% of our workforce um, are directly or indirectly involved in this industry. Over the last uh, five years, you heard these figures earlier from Mayor John, uh, the five years ending 2012, the government made from royalties $1.737 billion. $1.687 of that came out of oil and gas, so there's only $50 million, uh, in between that came out of the other minerals. So uh, Taranaki's contributing 97.2% of that total in the last five years. That's what the map looks like. I thought you might be interested because we hear a lot about this oil and gas exploration, but not everyone knows what it looks like geographically. It's a busy map, as you can see. Gas fields, oil fields. On there is the household names. Been around for a long time. Carpuni down here. The Maui stations. Onshore and offshore, of course, activity. Good mixture of both. Uh, and up north, uh, the giant Pukukura uh, gas field, just north of New Plymouth, which was one of the most recent and certainly the largest one currently in New Zealand. Down here we have a coupe platform, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. So, um, it's, a, it's a busy map. If we overlay that for a moment with our, with our local authority boundaries, you can see, just thinking back to the previous map, that that activity is, is reasonably well spread around. It happens across uh, the whole region. Um, but the difficulty is the benefits are actually not equally shared. Um, there is much more activity, economic activity, as a result of this industry that's centred in New Plymouth. 
um, and they also get the benefit of, besides a lot of the, the staff, the skilled staff that work there, um, things like sponsorship and things like WOMAD and their product centre and so on. Now, that's not a problem that New Zealand has to solve, it's not a problem for LGNZ, it's a problem for Taranaki, and it's, it's a debate we need to have ourselves. And it's a challenge for our council, in fact, as to how to reverse that trend, but the benefits are not uh, equally spread. So we just look at a couple of other key fundamentals under the economy just quickly, uh, unemployment and, and migration. And you can see that Taranaki sits in there. We're not certainly not the lowest. Three of the uh, South Island uh, regions hold, hold that uh, title. But 5.6% was substantially lower than most of New Zealand and, and the rest of the North Island. Migration, one of the key things, of course, that impacts on the oil and gas uh, industry because there's a lot of highly skilled uh, workers that are circling the globe. And um, what we found in the year ending, de this is the calendar year ending December 13, was we had a net gain of plus 56 people. Now, that is cause for some celebration. We only have to go back to 2008 and 3,000 people a month, or 35,000 a year, were leaving our shores um, from New Zealand. In, to in 2014, the same figure is 300 a month, and I think that was what caused uh, Prime Minister John Key to put the new the names of all of them recently. So it's come down substantially. We reversed the trend as a nation, and happily, uh, in Taranaki, with our highly transient workforce, we've also reversed it. But um, that net gain masks the fact that many of Taranaki's young, keen, productive workers have been leaving our region in droves for, for many, many years. And of course, um, Western Australia has been uh, the main destination for those. Taranaki, with its, its skill base of workers in oil and gas, has been like a, a shop window for for the Western Australian uh, companies that Kelvin was talking about earlier. Happily, that trend is also declining. You can see it peaked there in 2011 at 829 people heading into Oz. Uh, last year it was down to 360, so we hope that's a, an ongoing trend. Okay, so clearly if we look in the wider Taranaki picture, it's a very positive one. And there's, you, know, you could even say that, that we are blessed. There are certainly more positives than negatives, but I'd like, just like to shift the focus now to, to my patch and, explain, and just talk through one or two of the, the negative impacts that uh, can be experienced with, with this kind of economy. And the first one, and we've already heard it um, several times today, is what we call the, the boom and bust nature of things. Now, South Taranaki's had a, has long enjoyed a, a wonderful symbiotic relationship with, with oil and gas over many, many years, some, some 45 years in fact. Carpuni was discovered in 1959, it came into production in 1969. And when I went to school in the 1970s, it seemed like almost every second family had someone who was working at Carpuni or one of the oil and gas uh, installations that followed. It was a very important part of our community, part of the social fabric uh, and, and everything else. So that um, is, is in fact the, yeah, what course um, that created was hundreds of people employed locally, um, very high high wages, and, and those people often form the basis of our, our volunteer clubs, our, our sports committees, and the boards of trustees and things like that. And, and as Paul alluded to, you know, those trends are changing. Um, in terms of the South Taranaki economy these days, it, it goes more in cycles. We have major capex cycles where there's significant investment, uh, for instance, a new production station or a new drill goes in, and then we have our, our seasonal shutdowns. Now, these are not annual, it can be biannual or triannual, in fact. So that's what tends to drive our economy now. So every other year, we've got hundreds of workers who shift into towns like Harbour and Eltham. They fill all the motels up, which is great. They fill the, the, the restaurants. Um, but they also they also can have some, some downsides. So high occupancy rates are great if you're a, a motel owner. They're not so great if you're trying to organise a, a sports tournament and you want somewhere for the visiting team to stay, or even a, a family reunion. Busy restaurants, I think we can all live with that. Um, rental spikes. Great if you're a landlord, difficult if you're a house hunter, as Paul alluded to earlier. We uh, employed a, a, an engineer recently in South Taranaki and he wanted to bring his family of four with him um, during one of these uh, cyclic spikes. And we found that uh, the, the rental price for a four bedroom very standard four bedroom house was $700. Those are kind of Auckland prices and this is in, in Haura. So those are some of, the, some of the negative impacts. For the businesses of course, um, this kind of uh, boom bust type cycle is very difficult to plan for and it can change very quickly. Big companies like um, you know, Methanex and Carpuni, they can 
on, on just switch instantly and say, right, oh, we're going to double the length of our shutdown, or we're going to cancel it and do it next year. So it happens pretty fast. So as I said, the, the, the trends um, are changing. What we've got now is, is a highly mobile and transient workforce um, that works right across our region, and in fact, it works internationally. So the mega trends of globalisation, urbanisation, and technology aren't just affecting you know, the globe, they're actually being felt right here in Taranaki as well. So this, this stat here might, might actually surprise you. Each day, somewhere between 700 and 1,000 workers commute into South Taranaki for jobs. You can see the little carpooling depots all over our province. The other morning in Inglewood, there's, a, there's an empty uh, railway lot and there were 39 cars here at quarter past seven in the morning. There are no shops open at that time of the day. All those people have joined uh, existing carpools and they travel down to the high wage jobs in the south. And they take their wages home and spend them somewhere else. This happens from all across. It's not just a North Taranaki phenomenon. So um, what that means is, of course, the workforce these days has little social investment. They don't have the same sense of place. They're ch making choices on lifestyle and location around good schools, good health care, um, and cultural amenities, and, and, and who can blame them. So that's another one of the reasons why we want to see some shared revenue. Um, we need to work on the long-term sustainability, as the previous speakers are talking about, of our, of our district, our communities, our, and our social fabric. We need to halt and reverse the, um, those trends and access to some money will, will certainly help that. I just want to talk about a little, I said earlier on I was going to come back to Coupe, it's a little case study. There it is, a magnificent onshore production station that's just outside, between Hara and, and Manaya. And um, that feeds off the, the Coupe gas field, which was offshore, 30 kilometres out at sea, 3 kilometres below the surface. Um, and it was put in by Origin Energy and some other joint venture partners uh, it's been operating now under production for about four years. They spent $1.3 billion. At the height of construction in Coupe, 2007 through 2009, there were a 1,000 people working on that site. A whole lot of those uh, were, were living in our, in our local communities and creating some of those boom and bust um, influences I was talking about. Now, it's, that production station is uh, fully up and, and operating and has been for some years. 35 staff run it with state-of-the-art technology. So we've gone from a thousand a few years ago to 35 as the ongoing workforce and a number of those as I say commute in. There are another 80 in, in various contract type roles, trucking and maintenance, but that, it's, a, it's a really good example of, of uh, what technology is doing in the sector and to their communities. So what of the future? Well looking at the future we need to look back a little bit at the history because Tananaki has a very long history with oil and gas. It stretches back 150 years. Oil was first discovered in New Plymouth in, in 1865. And there's, a, there's a, a timeline there which shows you can see the, the early discoveries that you'll know and recognise. And the activity really builds up in the 21st century. And it stretches off out to the future with, with some, some question marks. And our council shares that concern over the future. What will happen to the the powerhouse economy and, and the rural service towns like Hawara once oil and gas runs out. Yes, we need to diversify and we need to plan for the future and, and we actually need to do it now. We believe there is a, a, a two-pronged solution is probably the best one. As I said, our council doesn't have a, a formal policy on this yet, but it will be developing one shortly. And we think that there needs to be um, a, a fund and we think the Western Australia model with the three funds that Kelvin talked about earlier makes a lot of sense. We'd be very keen to explore that further. So there needs to be something to deal with the, the immediate issues. Um, the development challenges I think Kelvin referred to it as. Loss of resources, people and services needed to maintain a healthy community I think was the, the quote he used and I think it's a good one. So some kind of fund to, to deal with the development challenges but also a legacy fund that's the future proofing, the long term resilience that's been talked about today. We must do something about putting something aside for the future. And in fact, why should we just stop with royalties? I mean, that's only part of the revenue picture. If you take into account the, the, the government's take from PAYE, GST, FBT, company tax, um, and Kelvin again talked about some of these in the Western Australian context, the total revenue stream is much, much higher. And maybe that should be the starting point for our, for our debate. So in Taranaki, we understand that we don't own the, the mineral wealth that's under our feet and, and off our coastline, uh, but it comes through our province. It is extracted through our backyard. 
and we believe that New Zealand Inc. would support um, some level of reinvestment in ensuring that backyard stays productive. So that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, us. Thank you very much.